Good day, Matrix, and welcome to today's lesson. I'm Renee Bishop. I'm a subject advisor for Life Sciences BCM in the Eastern Cape. And I'll be going through paper one with you. In today's lesson, we'll be covering the endocrine system and looking at the common mistakes that learners make in the paper. Let's get to it. The endocrine system counts 34 marks out of 150 marks in paper one. And so it is quite an important topic to study and a topic that many of you are struggling with. Let's look at what the guidelines say we need to start with. The endocrine system, we need to look at the difference between endocrine and exocrine glands and a definition of a hormone. Now, a hormone is an organic compound secreted in small quantities by the endocrine glands into the bloodstream. This is an important definition to know because it will help you to identify whether a gland is an endocrine or an exocrine gland. Right, so let's look at the differences between an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. Firstly, an endocrine gland is a gland that does not have ducts. In other words, we say they are ductless. And these glands secrete hormones. They pour their secretions directly into the bloodstream to reach target organs. So they, are, they have no ducts, they secrete hormones, and they pour their secretions directly into the bloodstream. An exocrine, on the other hand, has ducts, okay? Now, a duct is a small tube. So if we look here at this exocrine gland, we will see that here is the duct, all right? And the secretions travel up the duct, all right, to where it is going to be needed. Exocrine glands usually secrete enzymes and digestive juices, and they pour their secretions into the ducts, not into the bloodstream. Once you know the definition of an endocrine gland, all right, we need to learn the location of the following glands using a diagram, the hormones they secrete, and the functions of each hormone. All right, so this is important when you're studying. All right, get yourself a table and make sure that you are knowing for each of the glands where the gland is found, that you can identify it using a diagram, that you know which hormones they secrete, and you know the functions of those hormones. Okay, so the glands that you need to learn is the hypothalamus, which secretes ADH, the pituitary gland that secretes GH, TSH, FSH, LH, and prolactin. Remember, the pituitary gland is our master gland, but when we ask to name the gland, we need to call it the pituitary or the hypophysis. There's the thyroid gland that produces thyroxin, the isles of Langerhans in the pancreas that produce insulin and glucagon. Please note that the gland is the isle of Langerhans, and the, um, sorry, the gland is the pancreas, and the Isle of Langerhans are found in the pancreas. Right, we have the adrenal gland, which secretes adrenaline and aldosterone, the ovaries, secreting estrogen and progesterone, and the testes. Okay, so all those glands need to be learnt. Today, we're just going to focus on a few of them. Right, so as your guidelines indicated, it's very important that you understand from a diagram where these glands are found, okay, that you know the pituitary is here at the base of the brain. Right? Now remember the pituitary gland is an endocrine gland, so it secretes its secretions into the bloodstream. There are no ducts leading from it. Your hypothalamus, although your hypothalamus is not mentioned here in the guidelines, the hypothalamus, uh, I made a mistake, a huge one. The hypothalamus is in the guidelines. Can I redo? Okay, well, you cut it out. I'm going to start from the beginning of the slides. Okay. Okay. Just cut this part out where you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start from when I go to the slide. 
let me just oh my gosh now Okay, so it's important that we understand where these glands are found and therefore it's very important that you study from a diagram. Right, you need to know where each of these glands are found in the body. Right, so the pituitary gland is here at the base of the brain. Your hypothalamus is here, all right, above the pituitary gland. We have the thyroid gland which is around your voice box in your neck. Right, we have the Isles of Langerhans, which are found in the pancreas. We have the adrenal gland, which sits on top of the kidney. Right, it's not in the kidney, right, it's on top of the kidney. We have the ovaries, which are found in your abdominal cavity. And in males, we have the testes. Right, so using a diagram as you study, annotate the diagram with all the hormones and their functions alongside it. It's a very good study tool. Now your guidelines also describe that you that homeostasis as a process of maintaining a constant internal environment within narrow limits despite changes that take place internally and externally. Right, so that is a definition stated in your exam guidelines. So make sure that you study that definition. Right, your, your exam guidelines also indicate that the conditions within the cells depend on the conditions within the internal environment. Factors such as carbon dioxide, glucose, salt, water concentration, temperature and pH must all be kept constant in the internal environment because all these factors will affect how the cells are able to function. We need to look, according to your exam guidelines, at the negative feedback mechanisms controlling each of the following in the body. We've got the thyroxine levels. Now, thyroxine is produced by your thyroid gland. Right, we have your blood glucose levels, all right, your carbon dioxide levels, water balance, and salt balance. Right, now remember that Water balance is also known as osmoregulation, but salt also plays a role in balancing the water concentration in your blood, and we will look at that in the next slide. When you're studying these negative feedback mechanisms, it's very important that you are able to draw them out. Okay. Now, most of your exam questions ask you to explain. But in your books, you will notice that you often have a figure eight drawing. Okay, right? That figure eight drawing, okay, is a much easier way to study. All right, so we have our uh, consequences as we go around in the figure eight. I'm sure you're all familiar with your figure eight drawing. And it's a very easy method to study. But in the exam, if they ask you to explain how high water levels uh, will be regulated. You cannot draw this diagram, okay? All right, you need to explain using words. If you do this diagram and write it in, in as a diagram, you will lose all your marks. As the instruction in the front of your paper says, only draw diagrams on flowcharts when they are asked for. If you draw it in the wrong place when you're asked to explain in words, they will, the marker will not mark that question. Right, and then it's important to remember when you're answering these negative feedback uh, questions is that hormones don't stop and start. They are continuously being secreted to some degree. And the amount of hormone that is secreted changes according to the, con the conditions that are experienced in the body. Now, so when we talk about or describe hormones, we should talk about more or less hormone being produced, not the pituitary starts to produce or stops producing, okay? We'll rather say more or less. Now, another thing that you might struggle with is remembering when is more hormone produced, when is less hormone produced? And there's a very easy rule. So the general rule is that if there is a low concentration, let's say a low concentration of salt, 
or a low concentration of water, all right, or a low concentration of thyroxine, whatever is being regulated. If the concentration is low, it means that we need more hormone being produced. So for, a, for salt, we need more aldosterone, as aldosterone contains salt level. For water, we need more ADH. For thyroxine, we need more thyroid stimulating hormone being produced. Okay, so if the, hormone, if the concentration is low, more hormone is produced and therefore it will increase the level in the blood. Okay, so remember this general rule, all right, and obviously the opposite uh, applies where if the concentration is high, then less hormone is produced and levels will decrease. Right, so let's just have a look at the adrenal gland and how the adrenal gland uh, controls the homeostasis of water and salt in the blood. Now we're using this as an example of a uh, negative feedback mechanism. Right, so this is a nice question covering most of the topics um, that you need to study for this section. The first question asked us, identify organ X. And organ X here is your kidney. All right, the kidney is not an endocrine gland, but the adrenal gland is found on top of the kidney. B, it says, the system to which the adrenal gland belongs. Okay, so the adrenal gland is part of the endocrine gland. The adrenal gland is important in the homeostasis of water and salt in the blood. Now, it's important to note that when we talk about water and salt and carbon dioxide concentration, right, we talk about the concentration in the blood, okay, and not the concentration in the body, because it is the level of water and salt in the blood that is monitored and adjusted in this case. Right, so let's have a look at this question. In this question, they first asked you to identify organ X. Now, organ X is your kidney, all right? The adrenal glands are found on top of your kidney. Your kidney is not an endocrine gland, all right? But it is where the um, balance of water and salt takes place. B said the system to which the adrenal gland belongs, and that is the endocrine system. All right, remember the system that consists of all the endocrine glands. It asks for two characteristics of the type of glands that belong to the system identified. In other words, two characteristics of endocrine glands. And if you remember from previously, the two characteristics were that they are ductless, all right, they do not secrete their secretions into ducts, and they secrete their secretions into the blood, all right, and also that they secrete hormones. All right, so they secrete hormones and they are ductless. Now, let's look at homeostasis questions. 3.2.3, describe the interaction between the adrenal gland and organ X in maintaining homeostasis of salt levels in the blood. Right, so we are looking at the homeostasis of salt levels here, and we're looking at the interaction between the adrenal gland and organ X, which is the kidney. Right, now the adrenal gland produces two hormones. The hormone that controls salt levels is aldosterone. So this is the hormone that we need to describe here. Let's look at how we answer this question. The answer for 323 three is as follows. If salt levels are low, the adrenal gland is stimulated to secrete more aldosterone. Remember I said that it's not, it's not stimulated to start secreting aldosterone, it will secrete more aldosterone. 
This stimulates the kidney tubules to become more permeable to salt and more salt is reabsorbed into the blood. Now it's important that we use the word reabsorbed because salt was originally part of the blood and it was then filtered out into, in the kidney into the um, nephron, all right? And now the salt, if it's too high, it needs to be reabsorbed. Then salt levels in the blood will increase and return to normal. Okay, so we've used our, our flow chart where is, if salt levels are low, it causes more aldosterone to be secreted. We'll have more permeable to salt, more salt will be reabsorbed, and so the blood, salt in the blood increases. Okay, so